So we're here with Gary Zill at his mango nursery here. Of course he grows other things too, but there are like tens of thousands of mango plants behind us. So it seems fitting for him to hopefully talk about his big mango selection development and selection project that he started about 20 years ago, I think. And, uh, you know, basically how he, uh, how he designed the project and how he um, selected the varieties that he selected out of the thousands of seeds that he planted. So my turn. Yeah, it's your <laughs> turn. <laughs> okay. Well, um, yeah. First of all, about myself, I am in a nursery business. These are like fifty, no, like eighty thousand trees back there. A little seedlings to bud, but so that's my uh, bread and butter. Anyway, uh, back to the. Uh, uh, the project. It all started at a mango symposium in Miami. Uh, I believe it was Tony Wiley from Australia who was talking about how they were selecting um, uh, new varieties of trees for um, the market in Australia, which uh, in Australia everybody seems to like a particular type of flavor that's basically an Indo-Chinese type that uh, it's a very distinct aroma. It's a lot like uh, the, the, a good example would be the uh, Philippine mango. It's called Carabao in the Philippines, and Manila in Mexico, and Philippine in Cuba. Uh, and there's a there are a lot of other uh, mangoes with that similar flavor. Uh, the type they were interested in in Australia was the Kensington. It's, a, it's that type of uh, aroma. Very easy to, uh, very distinctive aroma. And they were talking about how they were uh, in the presentation about uh, being able to detect this particular aroma in the seedlings before when they were very young. So I got the idea, well, you know, there are a lot of other very distinct aromas to mangoes. I thought there were way too many mangoes on the market that tasted pretty much all in the same category all Hayden seedlings, all a similar flavor, all very distinct to some extent, but the only ones that at the time I was aware of that were really, really distinct were like the Bombay uh, and uh, Jakarta, which is a seedling of Bombay. Um, those were the only two that I knew of at the time. A particular aroma that I was especially interested in was one of the Gary mango, which got that from the uh, Pettigrew, Pettigrew mango, which nobody grows. It um, has a real problem of being uh, ripening unevenly and being too soft around the seed. My father originally cut down the tree when I was quite young, and I was pretty upset about it, but I could understand that the fruit always ripened unevenly. And, but I wanted to get something that had a similar flavor that um, uh, was a better quality. And the only thing that I only I had, we had this Gary mango, which I especially liked, but it was really too small. Um, the Hayden, Types don't have that. They're more of, uh, I would call them like the plain vanilla, but if you smell the leaf or the sap coming out of them, it's a pretty strong flavor, uh, aroma, but it, it doesn't have, it has neither the Indo Chinese uh, aroma or any of the other types. The um, mango called Pahari, or they call it Bombay, uh, you pick one of those and smell the sap, it's got a very distinct aroma and flavor that comes with it. Aromas have a big part of the uh, uh, the characteristics and the appeal of mangoes more than probably any other fruit that I can think of. Um, then there's um, varieties like a Kerry uh, or Julie or uh, even Nam Dot Maya is a little bit different. And all of those have a little distinctive aroma that is very strong in the sap, especially when you pick them just as they're almost mature. Although sometimes even when they're half it's the size of a pea, you can de detect it. And what I discovered is that 
young seedlings, the uh, tender new growth on those generally has the same aroma as the sap coming out of the leaf, which is a pretty big deal. Because um, I uh, decided, this was, I think it started in 1985, 1986. I'm not sure of those exact dates. All I know is I was just looking at my map and I started writing descriptions of these things back in 2001. So it was sometime before then. I would take off in the middle of the day and go get see uh, pick fruit from my backyard. I have a, had a, quite a collection of trees there and planted out seeds. And then later on, uh, I would, um, as they were germinating and coming up, I would smell the leaves and select from those. And I planted out about 3,000 seeds over a summer and did the same thing the next summer and the same thing the next summer. And all together, after three years, I planted out over 10,000 seed and selected about 1,000 trees to plant out in the field. Anyway, so when these seedlings started coming up, uh, this, every year these real young trees, once in a while, one would come out that had a similar aroma as the uh, Pettigrew or the Gary Mango. And those ones I selected for sure, but also the ones that had an Indo-Chinese aroma, ones that smelled a lot like, um, the leaf, uh, smelled a lot like the Bombay Mango, uh, you know, if you planted out a, a Zill or a Hayden or a, a Glen and it ended up smelling, had an aroma to those leaves like a Kerry mango, you know you had something different. And that was a lot of work. But once they were planted out in the field and they got big enough to start fruiting, um, that was a whole nother story because during the mango season, I would have to go out there Every day, I'd come out and get off work about 4.30, 5 o'clock, and I'd go out there to my backyard and pick, on average, about a little more than a bushel of fruit every day. During the peak of the season, sometimes early on it wasn't that many, late in the season it wasn't that many, in the last year after I'd cut down a bunch of trees it wasn't that many, but generally it was pretty common to have a bushel of fruit every day. Now my kitchen and my back porch were full of mangoes and then when it got too dark to see anymore I would come in and spend the rest of the evening cutting into the mangoes that had gotten riper and I had all my notes. I had a little uh, um, card index and I would write down whether I liked it or not and I'd put an X on it if I didn't think it was very good and I would put a save on it. And if I got three X's, I went ahead and cut it down. If I got three fruit that I just really wasn't sure. And I looked for things like if they had a lot of problems with internal breakdown. Some of them tasted terrible. What's really, really surprising, there were a few. Out of probably a thousand seed, a thousand fruit, there were probably four or five I wanted to rinse my mouth out afterwards. There were, But there are some of them that turned out to be very excellent. I had the trees in, uh, you know, I had it on, only on about five acres and uh, a thousand trees in five acres are pretty crowded. So if there was something that obviously, you know, either was way too small or just didn't like the flavor or really nothing really different about it, uh, I didn't waste any time. I cut it out. Uh, and that was the vast majority of them. Uh, some of them you cut into and the, the internal breakdown was just so bad that you, you knew you didn't want to, uh, to, to deal with that type of problem with the tree. So, uh, yeah, some of them I cut down the first year. I looked at it and was like, no, this tree isn't. But uh, oh, I kept some of them around for quite a few years before I finally decided. Some of them, uh, they looked really interesting and after a few years they just quit fruiting. And I had them grafted on other, other rootstocks and they still would. So, I, no, I spent a lot of time evaluating the ones that I thought were, were pretty uh, interesting. And I, everything, it was over a three year period I planted the seed, but it was over about a 10 or 12 or 15 year period that uh, they started fruiting it. 
Very few mangoes in this area, at least in South Florida, will start fruiting sooner than about 10 years from seed. Anyway, um, and some, some of them never did. Some of them never fruited. Uh, after 15, 18 years, I finally just gave up on them. And it was interesting, it was some certain varieties that were like that. Uh, I wanted to get an oak growing seed, but they never fruited those, those things. It was very strange. It's amazing to me the different uh, uh, variations. I planted a, I know, a Julie seed that came out looking very similar to them, but my flavor wise, uh, it's, it's really amazing what difference uh, you get when you plant out seeds. You just never know, especially if you're in an area where you get a lot of other trees for them to pollinate cross with. So, all in all, I planted out all these seedlings and ended up with keeping only about 20 trees. Uh, 20 or so varieties and gradually eliminated some of those. So, uh, that's how some of these new varieties that we're producing now, that's where they came from. Now, there are a lot of other very good mangoes from other parts of the world as well. There's a lot of them from uh, uh, a few from India and a few from uh, the from Southeast Asia, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, that are also excellent. But uh, I think these others have added uh, a little bit more to the palette of uh, flavors that you can uh, select from. And I still have some I haven't decided whether I'm going to keep or cut down. Uh, so uh, we'll see. And I, not that I think they're any big secret, I'm just not too sure uh, whether the average homeowner anyway wants to deal with some of the, the basically nutritional internal breakdown problems. Uh, production and that, well, <laughs> that can depend a lot on where you're growing them. And I haven't proper, there's some, uh, like one variety, like the one we call um, Sugar loaf. I just decided to start propagating a few more of those this year because it's a, that's an Edward seed that uh, definitely had a very distinct pedigree aroma. And if you look at it, uh, it looks a lot like the pedigree. The foliage isn't the same, but it's an interesting hybrid. Uh, Excellent flavor. Uh, everybody who tastes I mean, I had one person tell me that, more than one, tell me they've never eaten a mango that tasted so good. It's just, it is very, very good. But it has a problem that it got from the pedigree. It's not as bad, but it also doesn't ripen as evenly as I'd like it to. And it sometimes will be soft around the bottom of the seed, while the top is still a little bit green. Um, I think a lot of that can be alleviated by giving it extra calcium in the soil. I'm beginning to really be more and more convinced that calcium deficiencies can have a big effect on the quality of mangoes. But that's a whole other story. Anyway, so I've been very hesitant to just uh, recommend that to a lot of people because uh, it's one that I could see people uh, could have problems with and complaining about. On the other hand, I've had so much a uh, good response to when I brought fruit over for, for people to taste. It's like, well, we should graft a few of those anyway. So I think we did a few hundred of those this year. We, you know, I don't like to do fewer than about 200 trees in a year because they get lost in the nursery. We do, we do a lot of trees here. Yes. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I've got a few seeds I was thinking maybe I'd plant this year, but it really, it just takes so long. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Gary. Uh, it was a whole lot of good information, and so, yeah, definitely 
share that with the world. 